Hey, everybody out there ready? We ready to go? Okay, here we go. No talking on the other end. Good morning, everybody. And that song is called Some of These Days. Okay, here's a little bit of data about it. It was written by Shelton Brooks in 1910. Sophie Tucker, who was very popular in those days as a movie star singer, she heard this and immediately adopted it as her signature song. And she recorded it right away. Um, so that was a little bit of data about that song. It's still being played today. Matter of fact, probably every gig I ever do, we play it or the band plays it. So there you go. There's your cultural enrichment for this morning. And I say to you, there is no other show on TV or the internet where the host comes on who you think is going to do an interview and he's going to and plays a horn and plays a song that was written anywhere from 50 to 100 years ago. But this is the one place that it's done. And this is Life After Scientology, and I'm your host, Ron Miscavige. Okay, good morning, everybody. Now, to start off, I just want to announce we have a new patron, and it's TJB Fan. So, TJB Fan, for $3, I thank you very much. Thank you for contributing to the ongoingness of this program. And all of you out there, if you'd like to, instead of just being enlightened or entertained for whatever region you watch this, which is fine with me, you can turn from that into being an actual participant merely by, by becoming a patron. It could be for a dollar or two or five or ten dollars, whatever you want. But please, if you'd like to do it, move today and, and join up and become part of our team. So now, this morning, we have one of your favorite guests back in mine. Karen De La Courier, and a couple interviews ago, she mentioned that she would talk about the international executives that were declared suppressive persons. In other words, these are people who maybe have served uh, L. Ron Hubbard in the Church of Scientology for 30, 40, or 50 years. All of a sudden, they realize, wait a minute, these guys are suppressives. So to give you her take on it, which is very incisive and well thought out and a, a way, the way it is, she's telling the truth about this. Please welcome Karen Dilley Courier. Good morning, Karen. Hello, Ron. Hi, Sean. Hello, everybody. Okay, so look, <clears throat> as I mentioned to our audience, a couple interviews ago, we were talking about suppressives and them getting declared, but we never got into the top ones at the international base. And that's what I'd like to do today, if that's okay with you, Karen. Yes, you know, Ron, um, for decades, Scientology with the them versus us attitude always nailed the media and government as the bad guys. The CIA, the FBI, the Food and Drug Administration that confiscated the e-meters. The, well, they call it INS now, the Immigration Service. Any government agency was looked on as suppressive. The entire United States government was named suppressive. And then all of media, journalists, authors, writer, anyone who exposed or said anything about Scientology automatically 
had a label of being an antisocial personality, which in the cult is called suppressive person. But as you we were just launching into, in the last 10 to 15 years, the cult turned inward and the new suppressives were people who were on staff 30, 40 years. It is just unbelievable. The suppressives were no longer these external psychiatrists that electric shock people and the media, the TV, the authors, the journalists, the government, and um, anybody who spoke out at any time. Another breed of what's called suppressive person is a label given to anyone who escapes or flees. So if you leave the cult, the definition of who you are is suppressive person. Now, now um, we were talking about Mark Yeager, Greg Wilhelm, and Ray Medoff. Let's take up Ray Medoff. Okay. This is a guy who has the highest technical training. He's class 12 CS plus Dean of Tech. These are just labels, but he was the pinnacle, the apex, the zenith of all of the delivery of counseling. And when Hubbard was dying in the last six days at Creston Branch, <clears throat> Ray Midoff was there doing the counseling on Hubbard as he faded. He had a kind of dementia and he was fading out and Ray Midoff was there. Because Ray was looked on as the best of the best in terms of Scientology delivery, counseling. Well, in the <laughs> Ray Midoff subsequently was declared a suppressive person. He was assaulted numerous times. A fair estimate from all the people who speak out who were there is that he was punched, beaten, kicked to the floor, body slammed at least 40 times visibly as seen by others and has been a long-term resident of what is called suppressive person whole. Ron, please step in and tell briefly what is SP whole? Well, the SP whole is they had portable trailers purchased to be used by CMO, Commodore's Messenger Org. And these were put together and formed into a, a huge building, one story, but they're, they're basically trailers. And when the hole was started, what happened with that structure was there were bars put on all of the windows. The back door was not only barred shut, it was screwed shut. In other words, there were screws placed in it. So no matter what, you, you could not open that door. And then there was a security guard placed at the entrance so that in order for you to go in or go out, you have to go through a security guard. And then the people who were deemed SPs, suppressed persons, antisocial personalities, were put there and spent their entire day so-called coming up with sins they had committed and writing them down and uh, just self-abnegation, making themselves think, I've never been any good. I thought I was, but I just come to the conclusion I've been an SP all along. I mean, that insane. In the case of Ray Midoff, now look, this guy, as you pointed out, was the top technical person on the planet. All of a sudden, for him to be declared an SP it would be like the Pope of the Catholic Church taking his top cardinal and all of a sudden saying, Cardinal so-and-so, has been betraying me all these years. He is defrocked. He is now going back to be a parish priest, but he can't leave until he com confesses all of his sins. 
and then forever sitting down and confessing your sins. It's that insane. Ray Miroff was known by the public as the top technical guy, too. This is not just an internal thing. He was looked upon, as well as Mark Ager and Guillaume and, and Greg Wilher, as top-notch people. And they were, in fact. I mean, you know, a little bit nuts to, to go along with all this and never make a break for it. But nevertheless, they, they were the top technical people. And Ray Midoff, I mean, I knew him. I know all of these guys personally. These were nice people. These were not bad people. And, you know, you if you sit down with somebody who's a real son of a bitch, within minutes, you can say, hey, wait a minute. Something's off with this guy. And maybe it's your intuition that the guy's radiating his evilness at you. You pick up on it. I never picked up on, on any of these guys. Anyway, there, there's my two cents, Karen. Ray Midoff was um, an LSD case. They have this weird thing where they don't even believe in their own technology because apparently there are five different drug families <laughs> for you in Scientology. There's a Scientology drug rundown and a New Era Dianetics drug rundown and OT4 drug rundown and a NOTS drug rundown. And at every level, you're running out anytime you took drugs. So the, the, the entity called the Sea Org cannot recruit you and make you a Sea Org member if you've ever taken LSD, which is kind of bizarre. So they're saying their technology on handling your drug case or your drug incidents doesn't work. Ray Midhoff, <laughs> one thing about him is he's the most senior tech terminal, but he was an LSD case. Now, here's the thing on Ray. He was supposed to come back with knowledge and data of the next two higher levels, OT9 and 10. And Ray is said to have told David Miscavige, I can't remember it. And this infuriated, absolutely infuriated. How can he not remember? You see, these are cash cows selling a level, selling a new level. The old faithful has come tracking in to buy it. There has been no new OT level since 1986. Ooh, 33 years. So it's pretty obvious they don't have, have it. There's no way they would have something and not market it for new cash for 33 years. Do you agree, Ron? I do agree. And on the other hand, I'm going to throw two cents in here. Maybe L. Ron Hubbard didn't even mention it to Ray Midoff. <laughs> so him to say, I can't remember, maybe it was never mentioned. <laughs> that would be that would make more sense than anything, since <laughs> anything up at that level doesn't work to bring about the desired result. So for Ray to say, well, I can't remember, maybe he didn't say it. Well, that's also true. Uh OT8 is a concoction of little things they have culled out of Hubbard's folders. Hubbard would incessantly counsel himself in what's called solo auditing, hold the cans, meditate, and write down things. Right. Well, they've gone through those, and that's why OT8 the very highest level has five distinct versions or additions. Now, if you're doing a certain level, it isn't going to have <laughs> a different version depending what year you go to free wins for this level. How can it be? Yeah. But anyway, just, you know, these things are so gory and so macabre, but I do have to say, in SP Hall, the two key questions are, what crime do you have on David Miscavige? And what are your crimes on Scientology? And this is pounded in the inmates. They often have as many as 100 in there. This is pounded on the person. And they have a kind of hazing ritual where a whole bunch of them 
can start beating up on a single person in there. So there's actual violence that occurs. I think it's very important to say these things on record. Hammett police, Riverside police are completely backed off. This is in their zip code. Where is law enforcement? There's video after video, blog after blog, message board, groups, Twitters, denouncing the violence at this infamous, notorious int base, meaning international base or gold base, meaning the location where the hierarchy and all the top execs live. What do you think, Roman? Why do police do nothing? Well, I'll tell you. I don't think they have the courage to stand up to it, just like the politicians. There's not one politician in the United States of America who has come forward and they have got to see. That, in other words, there's too much on the Internet about the abuses of this church. for mm -hmm. this claim, I know nothing about it. And uh, I think well, I want to say something else that I want on record. Okay, go on. Laura Harris, when she was attorney general, was presented with an unbelievable one inch thick pack of documents, all part, written by lawyers. She was California attorney general. They know lawyers want to see it in legal. She kicked those people out of her office. Wait, who was this? I, I mean, Laura Harris. Wait, wait. I, I, let, let me stop talking and say the name without me talking. Go ahead. Kamala Harris. She's running for president currently. Wow. And when she was attorney general, she was given full documentation of the actual crimes being committed within, within the cult. Now, I want to, this is not a Democrat, Republican issue. This is just, she was attorney general. She was in the state of where huge crimes are committed internally by the cult huge crimes int basis there pack basis there kidnap held against will rpf atrocities rpf is the prison camp you're sent to for mind control when you messed up or when you become a dissident or you say critical things that's where you go. Atrocities occur there. Kamala Harris, currently running for president, apparently creeping up to Joe Biden's statistics, was given a full presentation with documented evidence. And when she was told it's about Scientology, she kicked the presenters out of her office she wouldn't accept the pack she wouldn't talk she wouldn't see them she wasn't even willing to receive the data wow and i hold a grudge against her for that because as attorney general she could have instigated some heavy investigations leading to are you talking about the attorney general of california of california yes yeah now we got to say that because i did i we, said it twice I, when I, Kamala I, Harris was attorney I, I, general of california okay right in sacramento she was visited by a couple of long-term veteran scientologists one was a lawyer and she would not receive the data wow. as attorney general of California. She had all the power to set up investigations and do this and that. And she did nothing. Okay, back to our discussion of int execs. Yeah. Greg Wilhair, what a sad character he is. He was ordered to divorce his wife, Sandy Wilhair, and he meekly obeyed. He was ordered by your son, David Miscavige. Yeah. Uh, David Miscavige has ordered 
a huge amount of divorces. Well, how, of, how about uh, Warren McShane? Didn't he order him to get yeah, yeah, yeah. And these men married 20, 25 years, boom, divorce because they're ordered to. And so Sandy was kicked out and she works in Los Angeles and battling her severe medical problems. Greg Wilhair has been always a devotee of David Miscavige. Yeah, I know that. And has taken any anything at all. So he's trusted. This big this is a big word, trust. Trusted. Um, he was the one, uh, you know, the story of Greg Wilhair's son yes. and Mark Headley were two Sea Org members that went through 40 videos of beautiful Scientology women to choose a girlfriend or sexual partner for Tom Cruise. Yep. You, you, you know that whole thing. Of course, yeah. Tom Cruise uh, finished with his last girlfriend. I think it was Penelope Cruise. And Tom Cruise, <laughs> he and David Miscavige uh, were very close. And David Miscavige ordered that a roundup was done of the most beautiful women in the cult. And they were given the spin that they might be selected to be in a Tom Cruise movie. So they all had to move. And Darius, the son of Greg Wilhelm and Mark Headley were a couple of Sea Org members choosing the best, the most, the prettiest, the most engaging, the most charming. And, uh, you got to you got to really pause and think about that, Ron. How can the Church of Scientology become a dating service, a pimping service for a movie star? These oh, yeah. are two old members. Hang on, Karen. I don't have to think about that more than about <laughs> two seconds, maybe one and a half seconds. <laughs> you imagine Tom Cruise, one of the top movie stars in the world, rich, good looking. He has to have somebody set him up with a girlfriend. Please, for God's sake, somebody sold him a bill of goods that only certain people could pick this friend for him. Well, they wanted to have a girl they would have completely under control, a Scientologist, one who would obey, one who would send knowledge report. You know, the, the girl was being groomed and chosen from within the church for an agenda. Yeah. They didn't want him going off with some non-Scientologist. So anyway, I did a diversion on Craig. Uh, because of his son Darius, who then this is this is Darius Wilhelm. He permitted David Miscavige to ex first his wife was expelled. Now his son was declared suppressive person and expelled. Darius was right Wilhelm, completely meek and mild, allowing his son to be kicked out, and he. Greg Wilhair continued to just work, not missing a beat. Well, I will tell you, it is the cleverest manipulation of people that possibly has ever gone on. Because when you think of brainwashing, you think of, you know, the North Koreans brainwashing people to go out and kill some of their, assassinate some of their opponents and stuff and do the dirty work. But you wouldn't think that let's say regular people when i say regular people people go out and get a job they work they raise families or somebody who comes in to help supposedly what they say clear this planet and make everybody aware that they're spiritual beings and everybody lives a happier life you wouldn't think that those people could be manipulated to do these things yet they have done that it, this is very clever brainwashing you know it does roll back to hubbard yeah, it does roll back. Harvard had the orders to say 
the planet was going to obey Scientology. It's in the class class eight tapes, right in his voice. Right. You will rule. It was quite a political. It was no longer spiritual. The reason these navy uniforms, these fake navy uniforms, are used, it's supposed to give a presence, which Hubbard called ethics presence. When people, I, I, I was once in uniform. I was in, I was in a supermarket in, in uniform, and you know, some strangers saluted, like being courteous, thinking, "Oh, it's a, a military person," you know, literally. <laughs> Yeah. So th this business of we will crush you if you don't obey the, the, the soul destroying element of SP Hole, fondly called the dungeon, where you go to be crushed and become a, become a scared little puppy wagging his tail doing whatever with cabbage doing whatever the hierarchy said this, yeah. this is and they turn wrong. into that too and, and, and Ron, scientology screams about psychiatry saying it's treatment by punishment putting you in an ice bath of ice cubes electric charge. this is trying to change your mind by punishment but that's what scientology does yeah it's become a form of psychiatry yeah it, it is, is. Because it's punishing you to change your mind. Yeah. And that's what the false purpose rundown is. Yep. And and you can be turned around so that something that you saw happen or you witnessed something, you, your mind could be turned around that you really didn't see that or that you're going to come up with evil purposes that you've always had. You didn't realize it and you've been bad after all. Now, I would like to get into uh, Mark Yeager, though, before we kind of run out oh, of as well yeah. in format. Yeah. I've I've always thought highly of Mark Yeager as. Oh. A, as a, hey, same here. I, I got to interrupt. Yeah. Because yeah. I I never had a bad situation with Mark Yeager. He was always, I don't know, just a very nice person. I do hope he's not mentally so crushed that he eventually could take the helm I, I don't know i don't know but anyway he's the he as an executive mark yeager i feel till he got some colors of following david miscavige's style mark yeager was really really a good man yeah one day mark yeager threatened to leave and david <laughs> David said, uh, if you leave, I will destroy you. This is in the book, uh, Blown for Good. Uh, Mark Yeager was told that, oh, this is what made him be sent into the wilderness for two years. I think we likely cover that. Didn't he have to live in a tent? I think we yeah, covered that in a previous thing. We, but we, that's we, covered, we, we covered this in a prior interview. But. Yeah, but the thing is, what he had said to toss him out there was he said he wanted to leave. Now, he wanted to leave because this is what this is what the CEO never look at. They scream about apostates and disaffected and blah, blah. They never look at what they did to cause the person to want to leave. And right. they never ever look at the earlier beginning of internal torture. I was tortured on t twice in that entity. Tortured. Yeah. Mentally tortured. Till I <laughs> sprung back and now I have a voice. But uh, I was crushed. This is what the cult does internally. It did it to um, Warren McChain. Warren McChain has been humiliated. Miss Cavish has called him the biggest liar of all time in a, in a derogatory, addressing, le letting the crew know that Warren McShane 
is the biggest liar on planet Earth. That this kind of thing is incredibly humiliating. So what happens with Warren McShane? You were there when his daughter wasn't allowed. No, 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 that's not Warren McShane. Excuse me. That was the other, the lawyer. The, the girl mocks him. The killed her. Warren McShane. Excuse yeah. me. Warren McShane was simply ordered to kick out his wife, Marcy. And Marcy was gone. Well, I'll tell you, this has... Uh... Uh, internal line that's really hidden but thought about by people who leave and I'll tell you what it could be this is my opinion of course it's yours I don't want to steal your thunder on this but I want to bring this up because what brought this up the first time to my mind was this I was promoted to be an officer and there is policy in the C organization that in order to wait in order to take away a person's rank there are certain actions you have to do to be able to take that away because it is his rank permanently. David just arbitrarily said, you guys are demoted to chief petty officer, took the rank away. And I thought, wait a minute, what happened to the policy that says it has to be such and such before they can do this? I no longer could trust the C organization to keep its word to me. There's a policy for schmolicy. It's whatever David Miscavige wants on any given day. That's policy. That is policy. That You're is right. Policy. But I, I didn't know that up until that you point. Didn't know. That point was the point that I thought, wait a minute. Yeah. This policy doesn't mean shit. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be this skip policy. <laughs> Committee of Evidence has so many days. 30 days after they haven't done it, David could come in and say, hey, wh where's the result of that? They'll go back and try the person. And of course, if you're put, brought before a committee of evidence, do not think for one minute that you'll be found not guilty. I've never in all the years I was in the Sea Org found anybody ever who was pronounced not guilty of the crimes. So these are kangaroo courts. These are just nuts. Exactly Let me just very, very quickly finish because I don't want, you know, I apologize. Warren McShane has always been legal, always in charge of the legal arena. Ken Moxon is the go-to little uh, little uh, pony for David Miscavige in the legal. So I, I kind of confused. So I apologize. Stacy Moxon was the daughter of Ken Moxon, and she was a young girl, like twenty-one. She wasn't allowed to go see her husband in Los Angeles. And can you finish the story of how she died? Well, I'd rather you know, there with it, it's, it's terrible. I got to tell you, I, you know, you know we're, it, it bothers me. So I, I prefer you do it, Karen. I hate like hell. Okay. You. Go on. Okay. Here's this beautiful 21 year old Sea Org member. And suddenly the story is she's electrocuted to death. What? And the, st the spin that the cult give Hemet police was, she went down these electrical vaults to rescue a squirrel. She committed suicide. Yeah. She put herself in an electrical vault to kill herself. This is just, this is a cult of death and destruction. It is unbelievable amount of deaths, and they are swept under the carpet with absolute utter lies. Yeah. All right. So, the, what is the lesson? If you watch one of these videos, the one thing I want you to take away is a lesson learned. What lesson did you learn from Ron and me today? My lesson is: please don't swallow and belong and give your life up to a guru. Bad, bad, bad. <laughs> what is the lesson learned? What what lesson did, what is the lesson learned? Ron, step in. Well, I think the lesson learned is this. You can't trust them. And mm -hmm. if you can't trust a group, you should not belong to it because their word means nothing. That's a good I mean, one. nada. And I mean, it boils down to that. And you can't trust them. It's 
proven time and time you again. You cannot have a relationship ongoing with anyone, a wife, a husband, a business partner, a church that you cannot trust. Bottom line is the cult of Scientology cannot be trusted. That's a good lesson. Well done. Good job. Um, I'll tell you. That is the entire thing summarized, isn't it, Karen? Yeah, yeah. You cannot trust them. And without trust, there can be no relationship. It's You'll be told lies. You don't know what a lie is, and you don't know what the truth is. How can you trust someone where in five seconds, two security guards can pounce on you and take you to a dungeon or the airport? This, 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 this is how you live when you're staff in the cult of Scientology. Yeah. Every second of the day, you can suddenly be summoned, removed from the job you're doing, and go into some kind of medieval torture program. Yeah. That is that is the scene of people who have relatives who are thinking of joining the C organization. That's how they live. They live under the fear of any moment they could be declared a suppressive person. It's just amazing how this entity can continue and persist. Well, I guess, well, I don't know what the hell I guess. I, I know this, when you, <laughs> when you have a lot of money and they've got like $3 billion and you have attorneys that will do your bidding for money, I mean, you, you can continue to go along on momentum itself. And anybody who stands up to you, if they go into litigation, they know they're going to outlast you because they have money to spend and they have nothing else to spend it on. They don't do anything to improve the lives of people outside of the church. They do improve their own lives by making a lot of money. I mean, some of the people that work for the IS and some of the FSMs who sell memberships, you know, make like a quarter of a million dollars a year doing this. So they have a vested interest in keeping this going and they turn a blind eye to, well, I don't want to know about that. Many of your movie stars will say, well, as long as I'm getting my auditing, I don't care what happens. Or they'll say it's all lies, whatever. It's all smoke and mirrors. It's a fake organization in as much as what they say has nothing to do with what they do. Your donations that are supposed to go for improving people's relationships or improving business people's uh, businesses or improving the environment. They're photo shoots. They go there and they shoot a photo. Uh, what, do you, what do you call these things? Yeah, I guess a photo shoot. Oh, yeah. A a photo opportunity. yeah, exactly. It's done to raise money and they keep the money. They don't spend it on what they say they're going to spend it. But the bottom line is what Karen said. You cannot trust them. You know, we had more things that I wanted to do regarding different types of suppressive persons. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I think I'd rather leave them with that message. How about you, Karen? Yes. 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 Okay. And um, we, we can cover that at, a, at another interview, which I'm yeah. sure we're going to do a lot more because for our listening audience, I, I got to tell you, um, you got to watch these shows because if Karen or Jeff or some of these people are going to talk, you're going to get get information that is going to help your lives and help you if you're in to get the hell out and just say the hell with it. I'm out of here. Or if you're thinking about doing it, just don't do it. I think Sean wants my attention. Sean, go on. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Some, uh, super chats. Okay. Sorry. I had to turn that mic down. Uh, Danielle Demchek for a dollar. She donated a dollar. Thank you, Danielle. Oh, Danielle. Thank you very much. Uh, I know that name. Yeah, Kimberly Hallman for two dollars. She donated two dollars. Thank you, Kimberly. Kimberly, thank you for me. Thomas Knowles for ten euro. Uh, he says hi, Osa. Uh, I'm thinking that's a little, a little sarcastic there. And, and what's the guy's name? Uh, Thomas Knowles. Thomas Knowles, thank you very much. Pauly M donated two dollars. Thank you, Pauly. Pauly, thank you very much. Um, and room 111 photography says for two dollars, Karen, you are the ultimate Scientology archivist. Karen, thank you for that. <laughs> thank you. True compliment, that's not flattery, that is an actual true statement. That's true. Well, 40 years in, 
2,500 rare photos and images, which I slowly trickle out on <laughs> Twitter. 2,500 rare images. I think he means it's my photo collection. There you go. Uh, you know, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. That's it. Thanks, everyone. Okay, thank you very much. And Karen, thank you very much for coming on. And remember, everybody out there, if you haven't joined to become a Patreon, today is the day to do it. Your help is very much appreciated. I welcome you to participate in this ongoing, I guess you could call it a crusade because it really is. But anyway, uh, most of all, I want to thank you, Karen. And uh, I'm sure we're going to be back together to do some other interview. So for, no, th thanks a lot, Karen. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Ron. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye now. And from me to you, this is Life After Scientology. I'm Ron Miscavige. I'll see you on the next episode. Bye-bye for now.